Whenever you're ready. <laughs> uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, before I get, begin today, I'd like to thank our other city leaders who are here uh, with me. Um, Alderman George Cardenas um, is here, and uh, Alderman Mike uh, Rodriguez. Since becoming mayor, one of the things I've been most proud of is our unqualified support of Chicago's immigrant and refugee communities. As the federal government has tried everything under the sun to stigmatize and scare them into the shadows, Chicago stood up and fought back. We upset some people, but we did so because it was really the only moral choice. Our city is a city of immigrants, built by immigrants, enriched by immigrants. And we will always stand with our immigrant communities, no matter what. That's what it means to be a proud, welcoming city and a proud sanctuary city for all people from every walk of life. That ethos is our heritage, shaping our history since John Baptiste du Sable first made his home here over two centuries ago. And it's that ethos that carries us to this moment and the new challenge we are confronting today. Since the COVID-19 crisis first reached our city's doorstep, we've been working round the clock to ensure our residents, all of our residents, are not only secure from the COVID virus, but are supported against the economic fallout of this terrible disease, both of which have impacted our entire city. While the federal government hasn't made all of its COVID-related benefits available to our nation's immigrants. The executive order I sign ensures all Chicagoans, included, including our immigrants and refugees, have equal access to these programs regardless of status. This means all benefits, opportunities, and services provided or administered by our city will be available to each of our residents, regardless of citizenship status. This includes the COVID-19 Housing Assistance Grant to help with housing costs for individuals and families, online enrichment learning resources available to every student at every level, regardless of status, and the $100 million Chicago Small Business Resiliency Fund to help our neighborhood businesses um, keep afloat during this crisis. These are all available to Chicago's entrepreneurs, including our immigrants and refugees. And perhaps most significant, we are standing up a um, disaster relief fund that puts money in the pockets of Chicagoans who have been excluded from needed federal aid programs. And we'll be working with local community partners to make sure this support goes to those most needed. For all those interested in learning more, please visit chicago.gov forward slash coronavirus. Once again, that's chicago.gov forward slash coronavirus. I welcome our, uh, Alderman Cardenas up here to say a few words in a moment, but before I do, I want to say this. This order is more than just an official decree. It's a statement of our values as a city and as Americans. We are saying we are all in this together means all of us, regardless of citizenship status, are in this together. It means that in this crisis, we will leave no one behind and no one will get left behind. I'm inspired every day by the acts of service, sacrifice, generosity, and grace I've seen across our city, from our healthcare workers and first responders, to our restaurants, many of them immigrant-owned, and immigrant employees who are still donating food despite their own constraints. It's in moments like this we see the true character of our city, and we find the bonds that hold all of us together in good times and bad. We are all in this together is not just a nice sentiment. It is an imperative for who we are and who we will remain as a city. Young and old, north, west, and south side, black, brown, white, immigrant and native born, all of us together as one city with one future and one destiny bound together. It's what's carried us through this crisis and what will lead us out of it and what will make us stronger. With that, it's now my pleasure to welcome our Alderman Cardenas um, to the podium. Alderman. Thank you, Mayor. Sure. First of all, thank you, Mayor. Um, I must commend you in your strong leadership and steely resolve to lead Chicago through this crisis. These are difficult times, no less. 
and predictable as well. But you are leading us with that focus, that uh, determination that you have shown from, since day one. But more importantly, empathy. You can see it in her resolve. You can see it in her eyes and what she means she does. Little Village, on my end, in the 12th Ward, is the heart and soul of the Mexican-American community. And just like every corner of the city, this pandemic has shocked my community to its core. COVID-19 does not discriminate. We all know that. And if recent weeks have taught us anything, it is just how interdependent we all are. Congress's response to this crisis has completely excluded the very immigrants that collectively pay billions of dollars of taxes, but more importantly, they're the heart and soul of the service economy, the ones that keep us uh, uh, safe, the ones that feed us, provide shelter for us across all industries. These individuals are getting hit the hardest. They have nowhere to turn for support. Again, I thank you, Mayor Lightfoot, for seeing that and reacting quickly. You know, just yesterday, I spoke to the CEO of Esperanza Health Centers, and they're doing now more testing um, in their two health centers that they have. And he told me that uh, of the 200 that they tested, 32% have become positive, have tested positive. And that tells you what's going on in, in our communities. It is silent. It's there. It is very real. Mm -hmm. And it's just sobering uh, that what's in front of us. And this is why I urge folks to stay indoors, not just the stay at home order, but stay indoors. As many people with warm weather uh, are taken to biking and walking and running, uh, it's important to understand also that if you get close to people, you are becoming part of the problem. I think it's the only way that we will control the spread of the virus. We must make sure that all Chicagoans meet their basic needs as well. And we're helping do that with the mayor's help. Our, our city's ability to contain this virus depends on it. And just as the mayor alluded to and said very eloquently, we must meet this moment together. No one can be excluded. And this executive order ensures that everyone in Chicago, regardless of their status, has somewhere to turn for support. And I thank you, Mayor, once again. No todos los residentes de Chicago califican para cheques de estímulos federal, seguro de desempleo estatal, o otra asistencia por su estatus migratorio. Estos habitantes de Chicago son miembros, miembros vitales de la comunidad que trabajan en diversas industrias y ayuda a, a la prosperidad de la ciudad de Chicago cada día. Estos habitantes de Chicago son nuestros familiares, compañeros de trabajo, vecinos y amigos. Aplaudo al alcalde de firmar esta ley ejecutiva para asegurar su elegibilidad para cualquier asistencia económica ofrecida por la ciudad de Chicago durante esta pandemia global. Um, Alderman Mike Rodriguez, 22nd Ward. Um, briefly, not all Chicago residents qualify for federal stimulus checks. Not all Chicago residents qualify for state unemployment insurance, or for that matter, most other economic supports that the federal and state governments are offering at this point. These Chicagoans are vital community members. They're our family members, they're our neighbors, they are our friends, they are co-congregants. They are Chicagoans. They work in industries throughout our city to make our city great and thrive every day. According to the Pew Center, uh, Hispanics, particularly Hispanics immigrants, are one of the sectors most likely to be experiencing hardship either through a lack of employment, cut in hours, or cut in jobs. You know, there's a family in my community that we're working to bring food to and support and get them to apply for assistance at the city level. Father, young man, works in the temp agency, can't work. Wife, undocumented, 
was laid off from a restaurant. Three citizen children. The fact is this family will not be eligible to receive checks in the next couple weeks from the federal government. They're not eligible for unemployment insurance at the state level. But they will be eligible for city supports. And I applaud the mayor for standing with undocumented individuals and families throughout this crisis and every day of the job. Thank you uh, very much, Mayor, for uh, signing this executive order. And uh, thank you very much for covering this issue. It's very important to our community. And now we're happy to take any of your questions. <clears throat> Mayor Lightfoot, could you elaborate a little further in how you see the city being able to help some of these hardworking families that are, that are in their home, um, you know, they don't have the financial support uh, from the federal government. How, how can the city government <clears throat> meet these folks and try to help them with the challenges they're facing? Well, I think we do it in a, a number of ways. Number one, um, as I indicated, um, every form of relief that we have stood up um, as a response to this crisis is open to everyone. We are not discriminating on the basis of citizenship status. And it's really important, I think, for people to know that. The other thing that I think we have to do, and we talked about this briefly yesterday um, when we disclosed what we're seeing in the demographic information, we've got to continue to expand our outreach um, to our immigrant and refugee uh, communities to talk to them about the dangers of the virus, why staying at home matters, and what they can do to protect themselves um, from hand washing, using um, uh, uh, hand sanitizers, um, but also just making sure social distancing is something that they understand and appreciate why it's so important. We need to make sure that um, they are connected up um, to the healthcare system. This is a significant challenge. We believe that there's substantial underreporting of the, the rate of infection in the Latinx community um, in particular. And so we're calling upon all those providers, the community clinics, the doctors and nurses and nurse practitioners um, that really service the immigrant and refugee community across um, the city uh, to make sure that they are advising their patients about the things that they should do to stay safe and that if they do experience um, some kind of um, uh, illness, uh, that they seek help right away uh, and, not, and not delay. And so that messaging is going to be part of what we are doing with this uh, racial equity uh, rapid response team, um, and we need to spread it far and wide. We talked a lot yesterday about the challenges that we're seeing in the black community, but this is really about social equity. Anywhere where we know that people have not had the same kind of opportunity to get connected up with the health system, to practice preventative care, that's an, an area where we know we've got challenges and we're going to meet those challenges. Uh, there's a question here from the Washington Post, Mike Garino, and mm -hmm. uh, Mayor, he's asking about the humor uh, that you've used to, to kind of reinforce your, your message and your stay-at-home order. Um, he's asking if you believe humor is effective in motivating Chicagoans to stay at home and if that was part of the original strategy or has it become something that has organically grown over time? Well, we, we were, uh, we've been thinking all along about what we could do um, to help people through this challenging time. Um, and we've got a, a great uh, creative team, and I've got to give all credit to uh, Michael Fastnack, who we announced yesterday as the chief marketing officer, um, and the, really the creative talent um, that he's brought to the table and of folks in our digital media. But yes, we were very intentional about 
the strategy. Um, <clears throat> obviously, the memes p cropped up um, and really became a thing uh, before we rolled out our specific strategy. But look, I think what what this moment tells us is people want a distraction. People want something to make them smile. People have been very creative uh, about uh, using the memes um, and creating them and spreading them um, in their network and across social media. I think it's helping sustain us in this time. You know, this is a beautiful, sunshiny day, but we're going to be in this for weeks to come. And so we've got to have something that people can really rally around. And I think that the, the memes and the social media that we've also put out and I'll tease, more to come. Um, I, I believe that that's really helped people get through this difficult time. Mayor Lightfoot, here, here's a question. She actually has a couple of questions. Fran Spielman. She always has multiple questions. Mm -hmm. And she's asking, um, you've said all along that economically sensitive revenues comprise only 25% of city revenues, mm -hmm. but that's a lot of money. What mid-year corrections do you anticipate having to make in your $11.6 billion budget? <coughs> furloughs, layoffs, program cuts, are tax increases needed? If not, how is that possible? Well, we're going to be coming out um, soon uh, with uh, what we think the I intermediate impact has been um, on our economy generally, um, but also on, on city revenues. We do not anticipate any of the draconian things that she listed, which is layoffs, furloughs, and so forth. That's a last result. What we need to be doing in this time is not shrinking government in terms of um, our our place in the economy. We need to be using um, government resources as a stimulus, if anything. That's why we've seen the stimulus bills at the federal level. The same applies here um, at the local level. We believe, and um, when I say we, I'm talking about our, our uh, economic team, um, including our CFO and our budget director. We believe that the worst thing that we can do when we're going through this kind of struggle is slash city services, slash um, city workforce, and pe put people on the street. Now, we have to make sure that we're striking the right balance, but when people are going through this really difficult economic time, we've got to think creatively about the way that we weather it and not say to folks who are out of work, unemployed, really struggling, by the way, give us more of your money. Now, I'm, not, I'm going to be very clear-eyed about the fact that if there is a need to raise additional revenue after we see in the long term what this impact is, I'm going to be straightforward and very transparent about it. But in this intermediate time, it's still really early for us to understand the full magnitude of the impact. We know certain sectors obviously have really been hit hard, hospitality, um, restaurant, um, and service industries. Those are really, I think, born the brunt of the shutdown, um, but we also see other um, industries that are really having, um, um, are really doing quite well, groceries, um, pharmaceuticals, and others. So understanding what the balance is, and we're still kind of in the, at the midpoint, I think not the end point, but we're going to be uh, releasing some uh, information in the coming days that kind of goes through what we see as the impacts um, and um, releasing um, what we believe are going to be the dollars that will come to Chicago, in particular from the last federal uh, stimulus uh, package. We're still waiting on guidance from the Treasury Department, for example. That's supposed to be coming today, and I'm hoping that that will be, um, if we get that today, uh, we'll be better, uh, well situated to put out a kind of fulsome report. Uh, question about the streets and sanitation workers. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> And they say they're picking up higher volumes of garbage with people staying at home, yeah. and they're saying they have not been given masks, gloves, or protective equipment. What is your response to that, and how is the city handling the higher volume of garbage? Well, I, people are staying at home, so it is not surprising to me that there's more um, refuge and hopefully recycling uh, that people are putting out um, on the curb. I'm not aware that the sanitation workers aren't being equipped, so well, that's something that we'll look into. But obviously, we want to make sure um, that they're protected. and at least from my anecdotal experience, a lot of sanitation workers are, are always wear gloves all year round um, because of the, um, the uh, hazards of handling other people's uh, waste. But we'll certainly look into the mask question. 
Uh, you talked about the weather earlier. It's going to be in the mm -hmm. 70s. Any, any word of warning for people who might think that it's okay to go back out to the lakefront? Yeah, it's the same caution that we've been given when the weather was uh, much colder uh, back in, in mid-March. Look, this is a moment that we live for in Chicago. We weather the winter and the first rays of, of sunshine and warming weather. We embrace it with gusto. Unfortunately, in this time, as Alderman Cardin has said, we cannot. We have to practice the same stay-at-home social distancing um, that has sustained us and has moved us from um, a, um, a doubling of cases from one to two days in March to where we are right now, which is nine to ten days. We've made that progress because people have complied. And to be clear, the issue isn't going outside, per se, or getting a walk or exercise or walking your dog. It's congregating. Fat is the problem. We want people to stay distant from each other, and that's why we're emphasized so much staying home to save lives. And uh, the federal government, any updates you can give, any improvements that you've seen as far as uh, PPE coming in, uh, are things getting any better? Um, I would say marginally so. Um, we just received, uh, the uh, Department of Public Health last night received, I believe, another 125 uh, vents, um, but that's a fraction of what we had requested. Um, so we will keep being very persistent in making sure that we make the case. As you know, um, I had a very cordial conversation with Vice President um, Pence uh, over the weekend, uh, and I made the case, as, I, as you would expect I would, for PPE, for vents, um, and I also ask uh, for him to um, think strongly about standing up a bipartisan, geographically diverse group of mayors to help advise the task force. What we've really seen from the beginning of this pandemic going back to January is a disconnect between what's happening at the federal level from the executive branch to what we have to execute and implement um, here in the localities. I think it would do well for the task force to have this kind of bipartisan, geographically diverse group of mayors because we're on the front lines. We're the people who have to implement all of the edicts that come down from the federal government. And having our voice in the mix, I think, is incredibly important. So um, I talked to the vice president about that, among other things, um, and we've already gotten some response. We'll see um, how this moves forward. But the reality is, we still don't have enough testing. Illinois lags way behind um, every other, uh, all of our neighbors, and certainly we're in the bottom tier of states that are doing testing because of the avail availability. It's not for lack of desire; it's for lack of the. Um, the tests themselves, the reagents, um, some of the other um, materials that we need to be able to process the tests. That's still a significant challenge um, here um, in Chicago and also in Illinois. Mayor, a question for, me, for you from WBZ. What is the city going to is going to do to ensure there is language access for immigrants and refugees who are not English or even Spanish proficient so they can access services? We have been um, trying to step up our translation of all city um, documents um, and information that we're pushing out in response to this pandemic in as many languages as possible, obviously covering um, the big uh, bulk of them, Spanish, Polish, um, Urdu, um, several Chinese dialects. Um, but we need to step up our efforts there. We know that this is a challenge, um, and we're trying to do our, the best that we can to meet this challenge, um, but we, there's more to do. Follow-up question from WBZ. Does the city have any plans to address the increasing reports of anti-Asian attacks in the area? I am actually not aware of um, any uptick um, targeted at the Asian community, but we have been very aggressive um, in going after any problems, making sure that we're connected up with the community, using law enforcement, also using our community navigators um, to educate people about what their rights are, how they can report it. But I'm not aware of any specific uh, uptick, um, but we will certainly look into that. Question from Telemundo. What information mm -hmm. 
or requisites would be required of those immigrants and refugees that seek that seek municipal relief and what official what would official agencies mm -hmm. have access to that information well the thing that we have been um preaching is uh, two things. One, we're using our delegate agencies, meaning um, community-based neighborhood organizations who have uh, legitimacy and credibility in a variety of communities across the city to really both provide um, technical assistance, if you will, uh, to people applying for various kinds of aid um, and making sure that they're giving us feedback about any difficulties that people are having. So having trusted community partners be the face of this outreach effort is intentional um, and I think has uh, paid dividends for us. Uh, but we're making sure um, that we are flexible because, for example, with um, the Small Business uh, Resiliency Fund, there are many small businesses that are unbanked, so they don't have a relationship with the bank. There are people um, in those um, uh, small businesses that may not have a paycheck. So we are really being flexible to make sure that we um, have people verifying what they're saying, but doing it in a way that that is um, mindful of the context and the reality of how uh, business is transacted and how people are working, particularly in neighborhood businesses. Question from Craig Delamore. Are officials getting any complaints from businesses trying to get relief from federal packages? Also, how are city offices keeping up with the requests for local help? Um, the first part of the question regarding um, complaints about um, getting access, yes, it it's continues to be a challenge. And so we are in conversation with a number of um, different stakeholders to see what we can do as a city to help people navigate um, what often is a lot of regulatory hoops to get access to federal funding, and we'll have more to say on that um, shortly. Question from Greg Pratt at the Tribune. Mm -hmm. Mayor. President Trump said you are complaining publicly and happy privately with the federal government. He said, and I quote, by the way, the mayor of Chicago, at least on the phone, is extremely happy with what we're doing, thanking us. I just wish the politicians would say to you what they say to us, end quote. Can you respond to what he said? Yeah, well, you know, look, the president says a lot of things, and oftentimes uh, it's an attempt to, to bait people, and I'm not going to take the bait. I'm not one way publicly in a different way privately uh, with the administration. I think I've been very, very clear that I'm going to call balls and strikes um, and be um, aggressive uh, advocate on behalf of my city when it comes to getting access to set federal resources like PPE, vents, um, and testing. Um, and also, I've been very outspoken and I will continue to be about the fact that the federal government needs to listen to the localities. But when they do something right, and I mentioned the vents that we got last night, not all that we asked for, but we're grateful for what we received. Um, and also, um, I thanked the vice president when I talked to him about what an amazing job the Army Corps of Engineers has done in helping set up uh, the alternate care facility at McCormick Place. I'm going to give credit where credit is due, but I'm always going to be um, an advocate calling balls and strikes and calling it what I see uh, when the federal government has stepped up, but also when they have failed. Follow-up question from Telemundo for clarity. Would personal information of those seeking relief be stored and shared with federal agencies? No, we don't, we don't do that. Um, that's, uh, we've been very clear about that. Our um, sanctuary city um, ordinance specifically precludes the sharing of any information. And while we are um, providing these uh, relief services, um, regardless of citizenship status, we're not collecting that information, so there's no database that's being generated in that regard. It's just your name. Question from Bill Cameron. What are some of the criteria which will determine when the stay-at-home order can be phased out? <clears throat> well, we're a long way away from that, and we are actually exploring that question now. Um, we've t been talking all along about a peak in the number of cases and then thinking about what the, the downward slide of that will be. Um, we are looking at when we think now we will reach that point. Um, as I said, we went from seeing cases double every one to two days. We're now in a nine to 10 day range, which is obviously progress, but we're not near the peak. 
So I don't want to raise false ex expectations that it's coming sometime soon. We don't know that based upon uh, the modeling that we've seen, uh, but we're, we're closely looking at that and looking at what would be the way in which we would come out of a stay at home order. And that's a conversation certainly we're having at the local level and we'll be engaging uh, the governor, his team about what that might look like um, uh, considering uh, the stay at home order that was issued um, by the governor himself. Question from John Byrne at the Tribune. Without this executive order, which benefits would undocumented immigrants and refugees not be eligible to receive? Well, it's not what they wouldn't be able to receive because we are a welcoming city and we've taken great pains to make sure that we're educating our immigrant and refugee communities um, that um, these funds that we've set up are available to them. But having codifying that and not just saying it in programmatic guidance, I think has a power um, and it makes it, it makes it real and it makes it um, something that is now part of the law of the city and I think that has power. Last question for me from A.D. Quigg at Cranes. Cook County Jail is now the number one national cluster <coughs> of COVID-19 outbreaks. Two people have died at Stateville Prison. Could you comment on how officials have handled those outbreaks? Well, what I, I can't really comment about IDOC because I don't have that much visibility into it, but I know from my conversations with Sheriff Dart and the ongoing conversations that are happening literally every day at the staff level, that they have been aggressively um, trying to decompress the dorm-like um, uh, settings where inmates um, uh, detainees have been gathered at Cook County Jail. We've offered our support. Um, our CDPH team is literally in a regular conversation with them and providing um, guidance. But this is a tough um, setting. Jails, nursing homes, other places that are congregate settings are exactly the kind of places where we need to bring a tremendous amount of focus. And But it's challenging because unlike in nursing homes, unlike in shelters, uh, people who are um, in jails, particularly given the emphasis on not locking up um, uh, nonviolent offenders, the people who are there are there for a reason. And so we will continue to work in partnership with Sheriff Dart um, and county officials to provide any assistance that we can, whether technical or otherwise. But it's a challenge, um, and I, th I think the sheriff has not shied away from being very clear about that challenge and the steps that they are taking to try to meet it. Thank you, Miss. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone.